everyone. Um, my name is Billy. I'm the CTO of Astro Digital. Uh, we're a California company, and uh, thanks to a Lifecom for the talk here today. And nice to meet you all. Um, the topic is lower of satellites, or lower orbit satellites, Leo. A little bit about our company. We have been manufacturing small satellites for almost 10 years, actually 10 years this year. And we started out as a small CubeSat company. Uh, Jen had a little picture of it, 10 by 10 by 10. And uh, we had a 6U for our first one. I'll show that to you in a bit. Um, company does mission to service, so we do essentially whatever the customer wants as data, bring that to us, and do a solution for them. Let's take a look at our services. Just a plug for our company. We have not only from mission design as coverage, like how much data they're going to get per orbit, and how much ground station coverage they're going to need. So at every for, for every mission, we have you know, certain requirements to bring down, whether it's radar data, data or uh, whether it's imaging data, like scanning microscopes with our scanning cameras, which I'll show in a bit. And we have our own technology, which is a high-speed data transmitter. Um, this is a KA band transmitter, and we use DBBS2 as our operation. Some customers. So Tomorrow IO is the weather radar company. The first picture that you saw um, is their satellite. It's got a big one meter KA dish. And it scans the atmosphere for uh, weather or water reflection. And so we integrate their radar and their electronics into our bus system. We're responsible for doing the control of the uh, spacecraft, so pointing on where they want to scan. And uh, download all that data back to our ground station. We have a KA station in Svalbard, Norway, which uh, is supportive of our high bandwidth KA modem. We can bring down around 25 gigabytes a day. Uh, Boeing, they're, everyone knows Boeing, but they're, they want to do some FCC work with us, some demonstration and payloads, and do that kind of work. Orbital Psychic is also a very interesting one. These guys are uh, an imaging company, hyperspectral. They have 256 channels on their telescope. Uh, what they do is they scan for oil pipelines for detecting leaks. Uh, and so this data is very valuable to them. We need to deliver to their customer uh, to not lose any oil. It's bad for the environment. They need money. EchoStar is one of our latest ones, and also part reason I'm here to talk to you today. EchoStar is the MBIOT constellation. We call it LERA. And it's a group of 24 satellites. They want to communicate um, also, they, they want to do two things. One, they want to secure the spectrum. They have it around a 2 gigahertz, uh, 50 megahertz band or so. And so they came to us asking us to develop a payload for them. That we can also do. And to, of course, control and operate their spacecraft. Okay. So the 6U. This is what we started out with. And then depending on what customers' needs are, you see that there's a trend to go higher. This is the Lyra constellation. Just squeeze that in there. Um, and we call this the XL configuration. This is what OSK, the big telescope, has. And this is the new one. Uh, we're still in design, Corvus 400. And you can see the power is going up. These, these power are orbital average power. In satellite terms, that's how much power you can generate for at any given moment, you have sunlight charged back up, and in the darkness, you have uh, you start burning battery power. So, this is not very much power, right? In in ground station world, 300 watts of DC power is not a whole lot to play with in terms of the distance that we need to communicate. We're not so far as geos, so but we still go up to up to 200 watts for our HPA. And so 
um, the customers are, this is, this is a government machine here. So, Corvus Excel, this is an inner satellite link mission using laser comm. And David has mentioned earlier uh, to communicate between constellations, between each spacecraft, we can either use laser or we can use cable. In this case, it's a demonstration laser communication system. Okay. So, bring to the topic of the day here um, how do we design a LEO constellation? And what does a direct cell or direct to device in this case the IoT device look like. So by the way, this picture is uh, a publicly released one as I can put it here. It's a Valera composition as well. <coughs> okay, let's talk about coverage. Coverage is different in terms of satellite means than terrestrial means. And what that means is in, imagine you have the cell phone station, the ground towers, but they don't populate, um, they don't cover you. Know, so you're driving, you have perception, but it gets cut off and you just don't have it anymore. So how do we design, it, how many satellites do we need? And how do we design this constellation? So first, you know, we, we use SpaceX primarily as our launch provider. They have reusable rockets and hydrogen fuel. We first send everything up, but there's one problem. We, SpaceX will always bring you to an SSO orbit because that's where most of the people are um, want to launch in. SSO is just sun-synchronous, so you keep going around one orbital plane, I'll call it the ring. And when, let me do a little finger demonstration here. So say this is Earth, and you have a ring around. You're always sending uh, 10 or so satellites up to this ring. How do we move it to different sites of Earth? So the way, one way we do this is to increase the velocity of the spacecraft with the increase in altitude. And the Earth is spinning underneath. So by the time it gets to the location that you want for this orbital plane, you decrease the velocity of the spacecraft so it comes down and locks in place. So now you have a new uh, a ring that has a different location than the previous one. And so another launch will come to the same area, launch up here, and do the same thing. So we call these orbital planes, and we call this a ran drift procedure. It's the most minimal less minimal energy procedure you can have to get multiple planes. This is an example of a um, satellite constellation. 6P10S. Six planes, 10 satellites per plane. So each of this ring here um, is indicative of a plane. and You have 10 satellites each. So this is only a total of 60 satellites, not even that much um, compared to SpaceX. So it's, like, uh, it's insane. <laughs> uh, 650 kilometer orbit, that's the altitude, and 10 degrees elevation. For us, elevation means, so your user end device is here, and you see 10 degrees off the horizon, so something off like that. Um, and that, that's an important number because that's the amount of coverage a satellite needs to handle. And therefore, the, um, the amount of satellite and you will need becomes more and more if this number goes up. So this is a table. And if, you, if you look at the Earth background, it's color-coded. And I, we color code this to indicate what is the revisit time. Earlier, my example of saying the revisit time of um, if you lose connection between stations, how much time is it before you reconnect to a new station when the station is in the satellite in this case? So the equator is where we have the most problem. Because you're, we don't have a ring in the equator using RAN drift. Okay, so you can see the ring there. And uh, this is time in seconds of revisit time. So you can see in the equator you can have close to 10 minutes of revisit time with 60 satellites, not a lot. And not a lot of satellites, so the coverage is not great. Can you imagine sending a text message and sent out in 10 minutes, and your friend replies, you gotta wait another 20 before you see something. It's not good. But in the northern uh, hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, coverage is much better. And you can get down to two minutes or even zero in some areas. So we, we do this in probability. 
Um, here is a kind of a table representation I was showing earlier to show you how many satellites you would need in order to achieve a better revisit time. Right. And the right. So if the table on the um, on each column it says satellites per plane, so that's each plane, each ring has X number of satellites. You multiply that by number of planes, how many planes are around Earth. So what you get here is a table of total number of satellites. You see how they start to add up really quickly from the 60 example. And it's the same table on the bottom, but it's, it's showing what the revisit time looks like. So for 374 satellites, uh, you have too many. And why, why is this so much higher than the other one? Because I set this uh, 650 kilometers to 30 degrees, which means earlier example is 10 degrees, big cover. Now it's 30, so you need exponentially more amount of satellites to get the same or better coverage. On the right is showing what um, this is. This is kind of representative of that little ring around the equator you're seeing with the red earlier, where beyond if you have less than a certain number of planes or certain number of satellites you just start losing time. It's, it's going to be exponential. There, there, there's an optimization here. Right? Around 19 planes and 17 satellites is where you get some pretty decent uh, coverage. But otherwise, it's going to be uh, less than two minutes. And, and the same way it goes the other way, right? The more satellites you have, it doesn't go to zero very quickly. Here is an example of one plane. You see this in Dr. Chen's presentation as well. Um, we have several satellites in the plane here, just three showing. And we're showing a multi beam satellite in the front, just representative, with a bunch of cell phones on the ground. And so whenever there's no coverage and you have the service links, which is linked to the end user, end user devices, then you have the K8 link to, or optical or K8 laser drum, to another satellite then you could, you could bounce the signal off. But it doesn't necessarily need to bounce signal off to the same plane. You could go cross plane to whichever one is the closest. And if you have a satellite that's talking to the ground, you need to track the ground. The, the reason you want to do this is you want to maintain that piece of um, land area, land mass underneath. You want to maintain this area right here so that it maintains the most amount of time in contact with satellites. Unfortunately for LEO satellites, they travel pretty slowly. I mean, they, they travel pretty quickly, so you lose connection very quickly. Every pass from horizon to horizon, 10 to 15 minutes, that's it. So as Dr. Chen says there, like, you're going to get a lot of disconnects, a lot of uh, traveling between cells, and that's the problem. I put this here, device Doppler compensation, meaning in, in release 18, the device itself is supposed to take care of Doppler compensation. One of the main problems that we're dealing with uh, in the presentation earlier. And so I want to show. Next slide. I want to show a possibility of how you would do satellite side compensation rather than device side compensation. So we have a satellite here traveling at a velocity of the blue arrow, B, and uh, a band beam. I use the band beam, but it could be a circular beam or whatnot. Um, you could compensate between beam 1 and beam 2, two different Dopplers. The Doppler would be around 50 kilohertz when it's off the horizon, so we would say that one we can subtract 50 kilohertz from the satellite side. And this one is a little closer to me, so maybe 40 kilohertz. So it represents two different beams up there. Uh, in this fashion, you device on the ground would not be able to see the difference between a satellite signal, except it's weak, and versus a uh, ground signal. So there are drawbacks, of course. The beam width there, you see I intend to kind of put it as a narrow beam, because you can only correct for the center of the beam. What's in front of the beam and what's behind the beam is still going to be affected by Doppler. And so a normal cell phone can roughly tolerate a difference of 150 hertz. 
So back calculated 150 hertz to angles, you roughly get a six kilometer coverage, which is a little pathetic in terms of um, how, but that is a limitation, right? You just gotta power up more beams for better coverage. And the longitude direction or the y direction there can be better because you know, velocity is, is not exactly, it doesn't experience the same velocity as uh, the satellite, but it does experience the rotation velocity of Earth. Satellite is kind of free floating. And if you have Earth rotating underneath, uh, you're going to experience a different Doppler as well. Okay. So uh, that roughly corresponds to around 800 kilometers of Doppler correction. So in this fashion, you could technically get something that works the same as uh, on the ground. But the device does not need modification besides the delay that was mentioned earlier. Okay, how do you build a LEO constellation? Well, we have, how do you build a satellite, essentially? Starship can carry 150,000 kilograms of uh, volume, and one of our satellites only 100. So we can launch 1,500 satellites into one launch when the Starship comes online. Uh, you need a bigger satellite because you need big thruster for the RAND drift. You need big antennas to focus the beam. It's a trade between antenna size, coverage, and data rate. So you need a bigger antenna for higher data rate. You need more multiple beams antenna for better coverage. And so, of course, you need inter-satellite links for interconnectivity. And so it, you're kind of playing a game here, depending on what your requirement is. You can't, you can't win on all fronts, or the cost goes up. So this is part of the service we offer to complete this tray for you to see what will fit your requirement. Okay. Nice pictures here. Um, that middle one is the, the Tomorrow IO's antenna, the one meter across weather radar. Two on the left has telescopes inside. You can't see it, but it's got a big um, 45 centimeter aperture telescope for the hyperspectral camera. And this is our team. Nice to meet you all.